here with Dr. Volk. We're going to go over some of the misconceptions of Botox. I'm going to ask him a couple questions here. So what can you not do after Botox injections? Okay, you can do anything after Botox injections. So you're hear a lot of myths that you're not supposed to lie down, not supposed to exercise, not supposed to push on the ear, not supposed to get hot. It's all, it's all BS. So Bo Botox has actually been around for about 60 years. It's been FDA approved for wrinkles for about 20 years. So the common things you might hear about would be don't push on the area or don't massage the area after Botox. Actually, theoretically, it would have faster uptake by moving the air, massaging the area, or exercising the area. So we're doing large areas like muscle spasm. We like to inject in why the muscles under spasm because the uptake will be faster. The uptake of Botox takes roughly 12 to 17 minutes. So when we inject the Botox into the muscle, there's a basically a, a push of those fluid into the muscle is get pulled up by the muscle end plate. And a half of it is done at about 10 minutes, in about 17 minutes, it's all taken up. Now, what makes it uptake faster is a few things. One is heat. Now, we don't need to heat the area up, but I'll hear, don't get in a sauna afterwards, and don't get exposed to heat. Heat would actually make it work faster. Now, cold on the other hand would make it work slower, but it would be immaterial. Mm -hmm. So if you ice the area down, theoretically, it might take 20 minutes for it to be taken up, but it doesn't really matter. So temperature has no effect on the clinical outcome. Motion does. Motion arguably would make it take up faster and get a little better response. So that could have a benefit. In medical Botox, we're doing large units in the big muscle. We do have an exercise muscle. For cosmetic Botox, it probably doesn't really matter. Motion, you mean by exercising the muscles? Yeah, probably only for the first few minutes. So let's say you do the Botox. I can usually have patients scrunch a couple of times. It might take up faster. But again, it's not clinically important. Okay. So talk again about the heat. Can you go into a sauna? Can you go into a hot tub? So let's say you did your Botox and immediately you got no sauna. It would arguably uptake faster. Mm -hmm. Okay. Since you're probably not going to sauna for half an hour, you have, you'll have no clinical issues. For sure, you can sauna after Botox. You can blow dry your hair at the sun. You can get hot. You can go out in the sun. I'm here. Don't go in the sun after Botox. That's all nonsense. The Botox is right. Now, it hasn't kicked in yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's been already taken up. It's no longer floating around so that there's no issues with that. What about lying down? Yeah, so that, that one a lot. Yeah, so really when they originally did the Botox FDA study, it was in the 80s and 90s, and they had people not lie down just for a reference point, okay? Mm -hmm. Turns out it makes no difference. It cannot affect the outcome of Botox, the complication of Botox, the, the effectiveness of Botox. You can lay down after your Botox. No what about working out? So working out, arguably it would work faster only if you did it within minutes after the Botox. So it was a half an hour afterwards, no positive, no positive or negative impact on the Botox. If you worked out your muscles immediately after Botox, arguably it'll kick in a little faster, a little bit more effective, but in general, no impact. It's certainly no contraindication you work out immediately after Botox. So why do you think there's so much misconception out there about what you can and can't do with Botox? Yeah, great question. What happens is when people are not scientists, they look for the nose. They look for things that people should not do. They go to conference, they start hearing stuff. Additionally, when you look at the product labeling, Botox was first came out as actually oculitum, it was, it was for the eye, for muscle spasm. And there's an, this is an interesting tidbit, if you don't know much about Botox, is Botox was bought by Allergan, the current maker of Botox, for $9 million in 1990, something that generated a billion dollars in revenue. They basically bought the patent back, back then. But um, the, the when they did their studies, they had certain criteria. First off, they used preservative-free saline, which we never do because it hurts like hell. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that doesn't, but it says it in the labeling. Also, it says use it within four hours. It is unchanged in a refrigerator for one year. Mm -hmm. So that may be used to make, but then mix it up and use it. You can mix it up and sit in a refrigerator for a day. No, no problem with that. <laughs> but they did say things like inject it in certain spots, which are not the appropriate spots, um, not to lay down four hours afterwards. They, they put that in the labeling, but as time goes out, we do studies and we find out it doesn't really matter. So it's something that those legacy just carry on. And I think from a scarcity standpoint, people want to scare you about stuff. So when a person has Botox, and let's say they didn't get the result they wanted, usually that's from not enough units or not proper injections, the provider wants to blame you. It's not your fault. Okay. So <laughs> it's either not enough units or wasn't put in the same pot. And rarely you are immune to Botox. Now what can happen you, there's really no true allergies to Botox. There's been one reported case in Turkey in about 2015. You don't get allergic to it. But people can make antibodies to the Botox, usually from very high number of units being done very often, starting at a young age. It doesn't occur with Zeal, but they can with Botox or Dysport or Juvo. 
And the Botox has a little protein tail on it that some people can make antibodies to, where eventually it's not working as good. We see that in less than one out of a thousand cosmetic patients. So it's really not a big risk. Um, another thing that can impact Botox's outcome is zinc. Now, Botox is zinc metal peroxidase and requires zinc to work. Mm-hmm. And healthy people are usually depleted in the zinc. The reason is healthy people typically eat a lot of fiber. And fiber is an anti-nutrient and extracts nutrients from your body. That's why they put zinc in different elements in cereal. That's why they're required to do that. Why they put it in cattle feed. So if you want your Botox to work longer, studies have shown that if you avoid um, grains a day or so beforehand or a day or so after, it takes a zinc, it might work a little bit better. Generally, it's not material, but somebody who's not working as well, that's one thing you can do. So let's just summarize. What can make Botox not work as well? Not enough units, mm-hmm. not put in the right spot. I mean, that's it. Occasionally, mm-hmm. neutralizing antibodies, very, very rare. <laughs> what can make it work worse? Instead of not working, work worse. Not having enough zinc may not last long enough. In addition to things I said before, not enough units. Work can work to make it work better. Having plenty of zinc on your body, putting it in the right spot, having adequate number of units, move it immediately afterwards for about a, you know maybe 30 seconds to a minute, and actually heat, and I'm not recommending using these finding them necessarily, but theoretically, it uptake faster. But the things regarding not laying out afterwards, don't exercise, don't get in a sauna, don't tan, this is all nonsense. It's designed to scare people or maybe blame them when they're Botox getting results they want to do. So mm-hmm. very, very safe. Uh, Botox is very, very safe. When I say Botox, I'm generically referring to Zeomin, you know, Dysport, mm-hmm. uh, Daxify, Jubo, and, and uh, Zeomin. They all have the same characteristics. There are slight differences between the different neurotoxins, but that those answers apply to, to all of them. What about uh, like facials or getting laser treatments done directly after? Is there a certain amount of time that you have to wait to have something like that done? That's a great question. It's something I missed when you asked my first question. One thing that can occur if you do Botox and we do what we call tumescing the face, we put a lot of water in the face to do a aggressive laser procedure, it can spread into areas we don't want it to spread. So that's one of the times that we won't do Botox and say um, laser resurfacing, aggressive laser resurfacing the same day. Usually we wait a day between them or a few hours between them. That's one thing that it cause, can cause unwanted spread. But you can get facial afterwards, a facial massage afterwards, an IPL afterwards, a Vegas peel afterwards, mm-hmm. all therapy afterwards, that microneedling afterwards, or even frequency microneedling afterwards. But something where we're putting a lot of volume in the face, uh, we want to give it a few hours. Just because if you do the Botox, and you have a bunch of volume in the in the face, it does make that 12 minutes of uptake last a little bit longer than the Botox can displace. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's a good one. Okay. Um, and how long does it take for it to kick in, actually? Okay, so if we look at the three major toxins that we're seeing right now, uh, which is zeomin, Botox, and Dysport. Okay, now there's a, two other ones I'm not going to talk about because they haven't studied head-to-head. Zeomin has the fastest onset, in about two to three days in, in women, and three to five in men. Mm-hmm. Botox in between, about three to five days in women, five to seven days in men. In this part, it's a little bit longer, about five to seven days in women, mm-hmm. and a little bit longer in men. Now, in terms of how long they last, Zima's got a little edge. It lasts about a week or 11 days longer. Um, Botox rate in between and this part, probably the shortest, if you're using equal clinical doses. The Dysport dosing is not matching up with Botox and Zima, but there's a ratio we use to get them the same. Mm-hmm. So we're using equal clinical doses a um, little faster onset, lower ratio of zeomin, Botox, you know, in the bumba berry, the middle, and then the, the Dysport a little shorter, uh, long lasting, and a little longer onset. Um, and Dysport spreads the most, zeomin the least, and Botox free in between. So you have subtle differences. Mm-hmm. So I would say we're probably on the higher end of dosing. Is there too many units a person could ever get? Would you ever get too many units? Yeah, so the... Um, a unit is defined by the LD50, lethal dose 50 in a Sprague Daily Mouse. And um, there's a, there's a, there's a, actually to test for Botox sensitivity, you actually got to sacrifice a mouse. So the units are based on some mouse model. However, we know that the, the, the lethal dose 50% for humans is 3,000 units. So if you did say 1,000 units, you are using a potentially close to dangerous dose. 3,000, it is risky. Jelly felt that 300 units and below for all humans is okay. Up to about a thousand in adults is okay, and typically we're not using a thousand or three hundred in the face. We're using those unsafe muscle spasms in the leg, neck, and neck is typically three hundred units. So for cosmetic dosing, there's really no dosage window because you really can't do enough that could be dangerous. 
Uh, the FDA dose is 64 units of Botox, and that's just the only dose. Mm -hmm. uh, you can use more than less than that. So the FDA is what they have approval to market for. Uh, as physicians, we're typically about 57 units in our average female patient, every male patient roughly 100 units. Mm -hmm. That's for typical treatments. If we're doing the neck and the lower face, more like you know, 100 to 150 units in women and 200 units in men. Mm -hmm. So what happens if you use more units? Last slaughterer. So there's a dose duration curve. Let's say the glabella, which is between the eyes, the first approved dose was 20 units by Botox in 2003. Lewis Light. So at that time, it was the newest thing uh, for the neurotoxin or any competitors. So you only had to get a certain percent. They, they expect 100% response rate. 20 units, you'll have about two thirds of people getting a decent response. Mm -hmm. It'll last about three months. However, if you do 30 units, you respond to about 95% of people for about three and a half months. If you use Zeomin, it lasts just a little bit longer, but we're seeing it in about three and a half to four months. Now, if you double the dose of neurotoxin, you go from 30 to 60, then it'll last twice as long. But it'll last about 50% longer, more so with Zeomin than with Botox. It is important. They're not quite as linear. Um, if I have somebody that's traveling away, they're going to Europe for six months, I'm putting 100 units of Cerebella. <laughs> There's no risk to it spreading into other areas from that, for that amount of units. Uh, it'll just last longer. Uh, there's a new product out called Daxify. Mm -hmm. Now, the Daxify is billed as the six-month toxic, okay? And there's a problem with that, okay? So if you say your toxic lasts six months, you expect it to last six months. It does it 47% of people, mm -hmm. okay? And you have to use twice as many units as you would have Botox or Xeomid. So now you use twice as many units for product that costs more to begin with for something that only 47% of the people less than half mm -hmm. and will get a longer duration. If you use twice as many units of Xeomid, you're going to get an average of five or six months that are toxic for almost everybody. So the there is a dose distribution um, or dose duration curve, but it's not linear. Typically, what we want the dose to last approximately four months because that's the best bang for your buck. You do it three times in a year, maybe three times the second year, the third year. Don't need it so much because the muscle that it rests so long, it has reversed its age, its atrophy. Mm -hmm. So typically, after about two years, these muscles have gone back in time. And it's just not necessary to do it either as often in the wars or uh, maybe once a year now. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. That was great information.